My name is Christina Yakiman. I do not work for the hotel. I work at Vanguard as a senior site reliability engineering specialist. Uh, Vanguard is one of the largest investment management companies in the world, so our reliability is very important to probably many of you here, also me, because Vanguard has all of my money. This talk is called The Scientific Method for Resilience, and my purpose with this talk is to use the scientific method that we learned all the way back in the day to talk about how we can test our systems for resilience with that same approach of experimentation. To start off, I'm going to make sure we all remember what the scientific method is, because for most of us, it's probably been a while since we were first introduced to this cycle. It's six steps, and they're pretty simple. It starts with observation. Based on what we see, what we observe, we're going to ask some questions. Then, as we come up with answers to those questions, we do so in the form of hypotheses. To either prove or disprove those hypotheses we've come up with, we run an experiment. Then we conduct some analysis of all of the results that we have available to us. And from that analysis, we draw and document our conclusions. And then the cycle starts all over again. That's probably the most important part, is that it is cyclical. So based on the conclusions we've drawn, we make new observations, we ask new questions, et cetera. So how does this apply to resilience? And more specifically, the resilience of our IT systems. At Vanguard, we're using this three-step cyclical process derived from the scientific method to do just that. We start with the failure modes and effects analysis, which, if I had to guess, is probably the one on this list that would be least familiar to most folks in the audience. And this is a meeting, but don't freak out. It's, it's not a long meeting. It's kind of a fun meeting. It's OK if you don't believe me. Hopefully, you will by the end. Uh, typically, it takes me about an hour to facilitate one of these meetings, and we get a whole bunch of the engineers working on a system probably into a Zoom call, not into a room, but we all talk about the different ways that our systems could fail and what would happen in those scenarios. The output of that is basically hypotheses, and then we use experimentation to prove or disprove that experimentation. That's the chaos engineering. Then, finally, as we look at the results of our chaos experiments, we're going to do everyone's favorite step, documentation and planning. Uh, this one's really important. I know it's not always the most fun step of the process, but when we get to that particular slide, I will reiterate why this one cannot be skipped. So let's get into each one of the steps. And I'm not going to go through the one, two, three steps. I'm going to go through the six steps of the scientific method and tell you where we are in the three-step process. So we start with observation. This is either the pre-read to the meeting or it's the beginning of the meeting itself, teeing up some of the context, we're going to reference an architecture diagram. And when I run these meetings and I share my screen, I tend to just throw an architecture diagram up and leave it there for the entire duration of the meeting. The goal is to identify the critical components, consider the business process flow, maybe there's some associated narrative, and make sure everyone in the room understands how the system was designed to work when things are going well. How do we think the system is running successfully? I've got a sample system architecture on the bottom of the screen. This one's going to be on the next several slides as we talk about each one of the steps in an example. It's a really simple one. We have the end user interacting with some sort of web UI. That web UI makes some sort of request to a cloud-based microservice which is doing writes to reads from a backend database. Nothing groundbreaking here. Hopefully familiar enough that it'll be an easy example to follow as we go through. Now, we're in the meeting. I think this is the fun part. This is where we get to ask questions and be creative. We discuss how each one of the components in our system might fail, all the different ways it might fail. And if that component failed, what would be the effect? Hence the failure modes and effects analysis. This is the part that makes it so exciting to include your junior engineers in the meeting. You obviously need the senior folks to provide the answers to those questions and, and help fuel that discussion, but your junior engineers are uniquely poised to be the best question askers because they have a self-perceived lack of understanding of the system, so these questions are genuine, and they're not going to skip the ones that some of the more senior engineers might think are 
common knowledge, we can skip that one, everyone knows this. So I have personally seen the new member of the team be the most effective question asker in this meeting. Now we're gonna stick with one question that you'd probably ask dozens in one of these meetings, just for the sake of example during this talk. This one is, what do you think would happen if the database became unavailable? In answering that question, we're gonna have a discussion. You might end up with, hey, right away we've got a hypothesis because we have group consensus. That's awesome. Sometimes that doesn't happen. These are my favorite. Because sometimes these people don't agree and they had no idea that their mental model of the system did not align with that of their peers. Because the scenario just never happened. And they weren't forced to face the disagreement in their mental models until they were asked to verbalize that mental model. So this is a great learning opportunity. There's value just there in that meeting without even finishing the cycle because you learned something that day. When people don't agree, that's also a really good flag of, hey, we should probably test this one. Not to like figure out who's right and give them a trophy, but so that the entire team can benefit from knowing how the system actually behaves. In the sample uh, example here, we're, we're just gonna say there was consensus for the sake of simplicity. If our database becomes unavailable, we're gonna hypothesize that writes would fail, because there's no database there anymore to write to, there's no decoupling, queuing, nothing like that. Uh, but we think that because we've built in some sort of in-memory cache in the microservice, that reads would continue to succeed. That's the hypothesis the senior engineers in this hypothetical failure modes and effects analysis have come up with for this scenario. Awesome, let's test it. Now we get to do the chaos engineering. And if you're interested in how exactly to do that, this is probably not that talk. I have given that talk though, so if you look up Cloudy with a Chance of Chaos from a past SRE con in 2020, I go into much more detail about how we do chaos engineering at Vanguard. The point here is to run a test somehow. It can be as simple as I click the shutdown button for the database. Just because it isn't automated or some fancy tool doesn't mean it's not the chaos engineering. So for this one, we're going to say, let's shut down our database in non-prod to test our assumption. All of the people that are like, no, we have to test in prod. Everyone's mad at me now. I get it. This is one of those scenarios I probably wouldn't test in prod, especially because I work at Vanguard. I'm not gonna go to my senior leaders and be like, guys, it's gonna be okay, because I think reads are gonna be fine. I'm only gonna break writes. It's gonna be fine, we're gonna be okay. Uh, they're not gonna love that from me. Um, so we're gonna test this one in non-prod because in this situation, I'd rather test it in non-prod than not test it at all. But I see you and I hear you, and you are right in those scenarios where we're not expecting the client impact and maybe we've tested it in non-prod before. Prod is the one and only prod-like environment. I gotcha, but we're doing it in non-prod this time. All right, so we run the experiment. We're doing our analysis. We're gonna use the available telemetry and observability tool stack to see the effects. Now, in order to do this, you need to have data points. That means you need to generate some loads somehow. And I don't mean you're gonna sit there and you're gonna refresh your browser like 15 times. That's not enough. So please use some sort of load generation tool. Even better if you can do this in the context of a broader performance test. Compare your observations to the hypothesis and just see, does this line up? Look at your dashboards, run some queries. You know what you're looking for because you have a hypothesis. In this case, oh no, it didn't work. Uh, but we, that doesn't mean it's a failure, it means we learned something. A retry storm of write requests from the web UI took out the microservice. What does that mean? It means we, we took down the database, and for a little while, things worked the way that we thought they would. We continued to serve up those reads from the in-memory cache. The writes weren't working, but that was okay. We thought we could gracefully degrade. What we didn't realize is that the web UI was written to make unlimited retries without any sort of exponential back off or a circuit breaker or any point where they would stop. So we just keep retrying and we essentially denial of service ourselves. The entire microservice goes down, all the instances crash, they take the in-memory cache down with it. Even if you are able to come back up because the database is down, you can't repopulate that cache. Now everything's broken and that's not good. But 
This is a good outcome of this test, right? Because we ran it in non-prod, and now we know. So let's draw some conclusions. Document your work. We want to make sure that not only do we know what we did, all of the different steps that we took, but also what we saw. Take screenshots from your observability tools. Or even better, if the results of your queries live in perpetuity, include links directly to those queries. And then spend some time action planning. Even if your hypothesis was proven, spend some time action planning. Whether it lined up with your expectations or not, did the system do what you wanted it to do? If not, make some changes. And now, whether or not you make changes as a direct result of what you saw in the test, your system's going to change. There's always modification of variables happening in the system because you're adding new features. Maybe you're migrating to new architectures. So down the road, you're going to want to repeat this cycle because the system will inevitably change. In our example, we're going to say, let's implement better retry logic first and foremost. That was the source of our disaster here. So let's do that. Maybe we'll change the way that our microservice auto scales or starts up. We'll look for an already started instance and see if we can copy over the contents of the cache. That would be cool. We'll do some investigation there. Then we'll retest and see if things work the way that we expected and if we can avoid the downtime that we observed this time. And that's it. That's the whole cycle. It just repeats from there. So if this sounds like something that you can apply at your organizations and you're going to go off and do that, I want to hear how it goes. So reach out to me, whether it's on the conference Slack or through one of the methods that's on the screen. I've got my LinkedIn and my Twitter up there. Please reach out. Tell me your stories. Ask me your questions about how to do this specifically within your organizations. And like I mentioned, if you want to understand the ins and outs of the chaos engineering part, we've got a whole other talk on that that you can find. And last but not least, shameless plug, Vanguard is hiring. So if you want to come work with me and some of the other awesome SREs at Vanguard, rather than point you at our careers site, I'm going to point you at me. We probably have thousands of postings out there. Not all of them are SRE postings. Come talk to me. We'll skip a few steps with HR. I'll get you right to the hiring managers for SRE. Good stuff. And with that, thank you so much for your time and attention this afternoon. We can do some Q&A.